pleasure to be here to speak uh, to the Federation. We have been members for a number of years. Our society uh, was, uh, was founded in 1984 and uh, we have been ongoing since. And of course, we produce an annual journal, Dubine, which is uh, um, one of the premier journals, I would imagine, in certainly in North America. So I'm going to talk today to you about the Spanish flu. I need to get my notes here. There we go. Have you a clicker? I know the name just yet. Not for a while. No, no, no. We're going to go on. Requiring a few days of work, 
rest, paracetamol, and hot metal drinks. It has, however, a long history, with records of outbreaks, some of them particularly virulent, dating back to Greek and Roman times. The name influenza itself was first used about the year 1500 when the Italians introduced the term to describe illnesses that they believed were influenced by the stars. This is nomenclature. It was originally thought that the source of the great flu was in Spain, earning it, earning it the sobriquet Spanish flu. But recent research has dismissed this theory. Spain at that time was a neutral country in the, in the war, so there was no new censorship. So whatever happened in Spain was published in the newspapers. And in addition to that, the King of Spain, Alfonso XIII, actually got the flu but didn't die from it. The name has persisted. And of course, why it wasn't used in, in other countries were it was such a, uh, such a pandemic, pandemic that uh, the military authorities did not want to demoralize the population and the troops. There is no evidence to suggest that the virus itself was already developing or incubating and probably metamorphosing in large British and military camps as early as late 1916-17, two in particular Italo in France and other shot in England. It is now generally accepted by modern researchers, however, that the, the virus actually originated in Kansas, USA. This state was the location of multiple pig farms and had a huge military base, Camp, Camp Frumston, which were preparing soldiers for shipping into the European war. It is possible, of course, that the flu, and this is a theory that's been put forward and never proved, it is, it is possible that the flu, that the virus was originally a swine flu, which jumped species and metamorphosed to uh, attack humankind. Yes, no. It is also known as the war flu, or the khaki plague, because of the association with the war. The Derry Journal, in its articles, floated the idea of a direct connection with the war, noting its appearance in some parts of Ireland following the return of troops. There can now be no doubt that troop movements associated with the war contributed to its extensive and rapid spread throughout Europe, including Ireland. It was also called the black flu, or the blood flu. This was because the horrendous symptoms exhibited by some of the more severe victims, and we will mention these distressing symptoms uh, in detail a little later on. The varying and uncertain nomenclature re re reflected the mystery surrounding the disease, so it was also referred to in Ireland, I'm speaking about, as a mysterious malady. In Ireland, there was general public disbelief that this infection was really a flu. They had experience with flu in 1892. It's certainly very different to the old flu which Irish people had experience of. Words and expressions such as exceptional, special, abnormal were used to indicate that this scourge was new and totally unfamiliar to the population. We ourselves, however, shall refer to it as the Great Flu, or as it was called in uh, in. Uh, <coughs> Irish being Gaelic speaking parts of Ireland and Virginia's born the Great Sickles. In this talk, we'll recognise clearly that it was indeed a global pandemic which essentially spread in three distinct waves. We are, of course, primarily concerned with the effects of the Great Flu in Ireland and more particularly in Ulster. One should also bear in mind that in 1918, Ireland had not yet suffered partition and had highly developed a highly developed national railway system, which Damien mentioned, of course, this morning. We now know that flus or viral infections, of course, do not recognise any political boundaries or borders. It must at the outset be recognised that bouts of influenza then as now were very regular visitor to Ireland and as such, it was a recognisable malady, causing temporary sickness and so forth. Normally, there was a relatively small mortality rate, 
as example in the previous view, flu of 1892. In previous flus, the casualties were the weakest in society, the very young, the old, or the sick. This particular flu, however, besides being different, was much more severe. As we, sh it, it, as we shall see, attacked the strongest and the healthiest in society. Its chaotic effects stirred memories in the early psyche of the cholera outbreaks of 1832 and the devastating effects of the North Wars from 70 years previously, which were still very much embedded in the early psyche. However, unlike the World War, it was no way peculiar to error. It exhibited the same clinical uniformity which it did in England and Wales, where it killed over 200,000 people. However, at the height of its passage, many in Ireland, because of its severity, identified it with a plague rather than a recognizable flu. Ordinary people could not believe that this was just a flu, and many country folk in what was then a religious country looked on it as a punishment sent from God for the terrible events occurring during the war years. There were many peculiar aspects of the great flu. But one of the most peculiar, although indirect, was how such a tragic and momentous event was so quickly forgotten, or rather pushed into the recesses of collective memory by the institutions of the state and by Irish historians. There can be no doubt that it left a deep imprint on individual social and family life, but this seems to have been contained as personal memories and grief, and despite the huge trauma, life moved on very quickly. Within a few short years, there was little recorded trace outside of the personal and family members of its general, general devastating It has only been since the 1970s that historical researchers have zoomed in on the Great Flu as a subject of research. This irony of neglect is magnified by the fact that the pandemic is inextricably linked with the First World War and more specifically its final year in 1918. Which, is in, which in itself has inspired enormous research impacting on a key moment in political history. In 1918, the two had formed a symbiotic and enormously destructive partnership. It would, however, seem that the memory of the last violent months of the war and the build up to and the euphoria of the armistice, following the plans for the political reorganization of Europe, and more specifically, the momentous events happening in Ireland at that time overshadowed even the memory of the Great Flu. The armistice in November 1918 itself caused a boost to the second phase of the flu, uh, as this is a nerve-borne, this was a nerve-borne epidemic, and because of the large crowds which took part in the streets to celebrate the end of the war, there was a jump or a spike in the flu in, in flu. <coughs> The Irish historian Jeremy Further referred to, referring to Ireland, observed, distracted by the enormity of the political change and the impending intensification of revolution, Irish historians have done little, this was ten years ago many, have done little to access its impact. In Ireland in 1918-19, this was a momentous year in our national history. The flu arrived in Ireland just after the German plot and the arrests that were being made surrounding that. The first and second flu waves, and we will discuss them later, happened to coincide with the 1918 elections which we heard about this morning. Drilling and arms raids and arrests were widespread during this period, and the inaugural session of Dáil Iron, which took place on the 21st of January 1919, the day of the show um, ambush, which is now recognised as the mark of the American or the Irish War of Independence. Throughout the country, wanted men were laid under the flu, and the RIC, who were of course also equally affected, were criticised in the press for pulling men from their sick beds. David Hogan, who was a pro Sinn Féin journalist agent, who travelled throughout the country by train prior to the 1918 election, that the end of 1918, <coughs> could not <coughs> reported that the grave diggers could not work hard enough to keep up with the flow of coffins. 
No one was exempt. In October 1918, Joe Dell, leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, was prevented from attending nationalist demonstrations as he was himself down with flu. On the international level, in 1918, in 1918, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States of America was a victim of the flu, as indeed were a large section of the German High Command. Indeed, there is a case that it can be made that the flu has indirectly affected the final course of the war by its devastating effect on that command. In Ireland, the winter of 1918 was interspersed with volunteer funerals throughout the country. In Belfast jail, the flu struck the internees and was noted that many of the victims were strong, fit men. Ernest Bly, who was mentioned previously, was the leader of the political prisoners in Belfast jail, and he reported that out of 200 men, only 30 were on their feet, and there was a great deal of bleeding from the nose, and two men went off their head and had to be removed from the side. The interesting thing about the jail, however, is there were no mortalities in Belfast jail. That wasn't the case in England. A loose concentration hit shot in Monmouthshire, there were six deaths, and the death of Richard Coleman, a Sinn Féin activist, in December 1918, and the high profile funeral which followed in Dublin was a public relations coup for Sinn Féin at the very opportune time of the 1918 election. The sudden deaths from flu of 36 year old activist and super. Fit strong on Pierce McCann in March 1919, uh, 100 years ago, who had been a founder member with Arthur Griffiths and W.T. Cosgrove of the Sinn Féin movement, shocked the then Ascendant Party to the core. And shortly afterwards, all the legal prisoners were released. So we have the three waves. The flu appeared in three waves. <laughs> The pandemic is generally depicted as unfolding in three wave in a three wave structure over 11 months, leaving influenza as an almost constant presence in Ireland from June 1918 until May 1919. The first wave, June 18 to September 18, this was the least virulent. It was shortest and geographically confined of the three waves. The first wave would seem to have originated in Belfast City. in early June 1918. This extremely widespread epidemic was traced to a military barracks in the city and the virus then was rapidly diffused quickly to munitions works, uh, mills, shipyards, all over the city and out to the surrounding area. It seems probable that it was brought to Belfast by military personnel home from the Western Front. It was very soon after detected in Balmaslo Dublin and Cork on the mainline railways, probably carried by military personnel using the rail network. This initial wave seemed to favour urbanised areas, and at this point it lacked a strongly contagious element. It didn't seem to transmit from person to person, and it didn't, uh, it didn't penetrate into the rural areas. It also seemed to appear in towns that were linked by the rail network and by August, the epidemic appeared to be on the wall. The second wave of October 1918 to January 19, in early and mid-October, influenza again began to interrupt in, in Ireland. Unlike the gradual and easily perceptible movement of the first wave, this new wave moved at a much faster rate and was much more severe. There is a current theory that the virus may have undergone an on-site mutation, uh, having already been seeded by the first wave. The geographical path of the second wave was difficult to trace as it coursed through the transport network at breakneck speed, erup erupting in all four provinces, including much Ulster. It travelled from east to west and entered northwest Donegal in December 1918. There can be little doubt that the railway network and the troop movements, movements facilitated its rapid spread. 
But when it came to local diffusion, social events, such as dances, wakes, court hearings, markets, religious service, general election activities, and other social activities were the mechanisms which precipitated this diffusion. There is evidence that sites on the mainline rail network were the first to suffer, and there was a delay in the flu region in the outlying branches. Unlike the first rail, the, the flu spread swiftly and efficiently to outlying rural areas of major towns and permeated the countryside to a far greater extent than the first wave. The third and final wave, dates may be a wee bit dubious, started approximately February 1919 to June 1919. It has been difficult for researchers to identify the precise start of the third wave. The second wave, for example, was still prevalent in areas like North Donegal in early January. New flare-ups occurred spasmodically in parts of the south in January and there was a flare-up in Fermanagh about that time. In general, the flu was this time more gradual in its spread than before. It was less explosive than the first two waves. However, in 1919, it had the ability to extend even further into the rural areas reaching places previously unaffected. What took place was a highly localised and highly contagious process. The areas most distressed by this third wave were areas of low population density, including five of the ten counties that were considered congested districts. These isolated areas, including Donegal, suffered harshly from this third wave with a high proportion of mortalities. It is also now apparent that these areas, which were badly affected by the first wave, for example, Lurgan, and here in County Armagh, were less affected by the second wave. Vice versa, those who had escaped the first wave, particularly as an example in Uri, were very badly uh, affected by the second wave. There is also the belief that surviving the previous wave may have provided an immunity factor to the wave following. So this this shows you the, the counties that were this chart shows you the counties or the areas that were bothered. The darker areas are the ones with, with exceptionally high mortality rates. So you have, for example, you have Donegal, uh, and you have the northeast here, particularly around Belfast, and right down the east coast, taking in Dublin, which was extremely badly affected. The areas, the lighter areas in the middle, weren't, if any, were, were affected, but not very badly. But these areas in the west contacted the flu, but not to the same devastating effect as on the east of the country. And in 1919, you will see that to a certain extent it's the same situation. Though when I say that these, these counties in the West, Cork and so forth, were not badly affected, they were, but not as badly affected as the East Coast, Donegal, the North East, Brown, Belfast, and Dublin, uh, North and South. This is a chart of the number of influence, times of death in 19, uh, sorry, in the 1918 flu. The thing that, that's interesting, and you may not be able to see it all that well, is the age groups here. The age is on the bottom here, and you will find that, unlike other flus, the spike is in the area from about 20 year old to 45 year old. That was the people who were being killed by this flu. Now this is the flu, the previous flu of 1892, uh, and you will see again if you look at the age group, the younger people and the older people were the ones that were badly affected uh, by that particular uh, flu. So there was a substantial difference. 
peculiarity of this particular flu, and um, I elaborated on that, was that it affected young, strong, healthy adults, in many cases the family breadwinners. Children were spared when their, par when their parents died. Older parents had to endure the trauma of seeing their grown-up children, often severed in one household, <coughs> and there's quite a bit of research has been done in both Lurgan and Murian this, uh, pass away before them. A large proportion of those who died were in life's prime and were often the wage earners for the family. We heard the, the comment on that Damien was making about the importance of wage earners. In Lurgan, as elsewhere, it was noted that the children were not as much affected as adults. In Ireland as elsewhere, this flu had attacked pre- as I said, elsewhere, this is a common thing throughout the world, it attacked the previously healthy youth, particularly young men. Research into why this flu virus was so lethal to young people is still ongoing, but recent findings indicate that it is linked to the response the virus provoked in the body itself. The particular strain of virus managed to derail the body's reaction to viral infection. The result was that rather than defend the body, the immune system of victims often stimulated an attack on the lungs, causing them to fill up with fluids, effectively drowning the victim, in fact, a type of pneumonia. In addition to age, gender was another, indi uh, another indicator of susceptibility. Male influenza deaths outnumbered females by over 10% in, previously in 1892. Sorry, this one, the, the males actually outnumbered the females, not other than previous groups. However, the case of pregnant women in this trend was reversed and this sector proved to be particularly vulnerable. However, in urban areas like Belfast, Mortalities amongst young women were 10% higher than the national average. And of course, the reason for that is the linen factories and the munitions factories associated with the war. Three, four, five thousand women working within a, within a, 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 a non desirable environment. Those are um, influential mortality rates for the uh, Dr. Patricia March has, has extrapolated the Ulster in 1918 and 19, and you can see there that uh, Belfast County Borough had 18 uh, influenza mortality at 1830, uh, and was 4.72% of, uh, of the population. Arm 704, Armagh 692, Calvin 339. Donegal, very high, 1,000, for a rural community, 1,074. Uh, um, Down, 1,062. Um, Fermanagh, 236. Uh, Derry and, and, and Borough, 683. Monaghan, 386. Tyrone, 594. And the total for us, 7,582. And of course, this doesn't take into account people who were left with long-term disabilities out of the flu and they may have died within a short time after the flu. Now, the 1918-19 flu was particularly prevalent among those residents in institutions. There was an extensive spread of the virus throughout the workhouse network. The hospitals were full to capacity, and the staff, of course, were not immune. The virus also spread through the asylum system, and very, uh, where, was, where there were very high mortality rates. The regional medical superintendent at the Tyrone and Fermanagh asylum admitted that the flu patients were exceedingly bad, requiring two cures per patient, and of course the staff were also been led to by the flu. Many patients were admitted on the basis that the flu was causing a mental condition, in other words, raving. The industrial school was also badly affected. We don't know about these now, but the industrial school was all. Statistics show that the flu was the cause of death in one to four boys. The prison system was badly affected during the second and third waves, affecting inmates and staff alike. Belfast Prison 
witnessed the worst of the second wave. That's 1918. In October 1918, 119 of the political prisoners were down as blue. Remarkably, as I said before, they were known for tolerance. In hindsight, the physical layout of the old Victorian institutional systems which constituted the Irish Health Service in 1918-19 undoubtedly contributed to the spread of the virus. In terms of in terms of professions, those whose think about of sink there, those whose jobs necessitated frequent contact with members of the public and involved living in close quarters run at a specifically high risk of contacting the virus. The army, the police, uh, postal delivery men, very badly headed, postal delivery men were va very badly headed, uh, and the prison service proved to be the most vulnerable. Priests and ministers of religion, from all denominations, through didn't discriminate, were common victims. Obviously they were out helping their flocks and that's where they were becoming uh, effective. Railway staff were also badly affected. Workers in factories and mills and such were likely to become infected once the virus entered the workplace. In many places, postal service, religious services and even newspapers were temporarily interrupted Due to the employee, due to employees being affected and led up to the flu. Wealth provided no definite barrier to infection. The 1918 flu infiltrated the ranks of professionals, including eminent businessmen, politicians, solicitors, and barristers. Rich and poor alike were infected. The obituaries of the period made it clear that there were many flu deaths among them. And this was a common quote in, in, in the early 19th century, old and respected families around the country. Incidentally, illustrating the way in which social status was embodied and constructed in the early 20th century. But the flu itself was indiscriminate in terms of who it affected. The experience of the, of, of the sickness across the class divide was very different. Wealthy families infected with the flu could pay substantial fees for doctors and nurses, thereby maximizing their chances of recovery by hiring medical skill and devoted care. The profile of mortality in Dublin in 1918 illustrates the way that class and wealth affected mortality. The general service class suffered the highest increases in death. Mortality rose by about a third. Death rates decreased in accordance with the rise in social class. Among artisans and small shopkeepers, deaths increased by 25%. In the middle classes, deaths rose by about 20%. Within the professional and independent classes, deaths increased by only 5%. The group which included persons of rank and property was the sole class which witnessed a decline in pneumonia-related deaths in 1917-18. In contrast, pneumonia-related deaths among the general service class increased by over 30% in this period. While sickness spread to all classes, levels of suffering differed substantially with treatment, with one's chances of survival increasing in accordance with your wealth. Whilst these figures relate to Dublin, similar figures relate to the main urban industrial areas in the north, including Belfast and Mary. This would lead to the conclusion that a number of people died in 1918-19 because of inadequate care and attention rising from the lack of resources and personnel at that time within the old fashioned existing health system. And undoubtedly this was partly a side effect of the war. A conventional response in previous centuries to epidemics was to scapegoat the poor. Sickness was previously seen to develop within the fever nests of the poor and then contaminate the other upper classes. This did not happen with this flu in 1919, as it was obvious that this disease was global and indiscriminate in class. If blame was attributed by the general population, it was to the war and the home. No, sorry. A 
mentioned symptoms earlier. In a percentage of cases, the standard severe flu type symptoms which all victims exhibited were intensified and the flu became a disease with a violent and unsettling symptomology. The flu could suddenly take an acute form and inflict such damage as never before experienced. Doctors recorded the occurrence of projective nosebleeds with substantial losses of blood. In some cases, patients coughed up almost pure blood. Some bled from the ears, and autopsies revealed blood sodden lungs, sometimes laden with pus. The most ominous sign was when the patient's skin began to turn a dusky blue colour um, as, the, as the blood stopped circulating with sufficient oxygen. This condition, in medical terms, is described as heliotropic cyanosis. This usually indicated the terminal position, and in the workhouses, it was looked on as the beginning of the end. Autopsies showed a startling degrees of internal damage in such cases. Kidneys oozed with blood, livers were swollen and enlarged, and in some cases, the thyroid gland was swollen and severe damage caused the respiratory tract. It was also common for patients to show signs of insanity, and in Ireland at that time, there were many cases of suicide, which do not, these figures do not take into account. As the population confront, confronted an infection that could appear suddenly and kill quickly, the fear factor throughout the communities became increasingly apparent, particularly during the brutal second wave, that was towards the end of 1918. Alarm and certain amount of panic spread in pockets throughout the country in reaction to this, to this new disease, which was called in some cases in Chinese Nua, which in many cases were looked on as a plague. Over the course of the flu period, people's fears varied, influencing their actions and routines towards everyday places, objects, normal social interaction, and other people. You can understand that. Trust was severed, and social norms and bonds started to disintegrate. Not just the fear of the sick, but there was a fear of corpses, of the dead flu. <coughs> dead corpses created fear and anxiety. The traditional Irish wake was in many places increasingly abandoned, and was, as was the practice of leaving the remains in the church overnight for fear of infection. Flu victims were buried as soon as possible. An example, for example, of this breakdown in social activities was in Ballytrain County Bonham, two brothers, small farmers, were infected at the same time, and they could get no neighbour who would enter the house to help them. In rural areas, the old plague fields that the infection was in the dwell and the contents was increasingly prevalent. In the past, as you may have read, the plague houses were cleansed with fire. Fear of the flu was evident, an awareness of the sick and an unwillingness to venture near flu sufferers. As the epidemic gathered pace, the conventions of neighbourliness and mutual support which underpinned the area's rural system started to erode. It even became difficult to get grave diggers in rural areas, and for example, the Lisnesky poor dog yards, as in many other places, were forced to pay a premium to non medical staff dealing with flu victims and the dead. Places where crowds normally gather, such as dances, theatres, and even essential markets and churches, were sparsely attended or abandoned. Business owners in the towns reported a huge drop off in customers. Schools in particular were badly affected, and in many cases, cases suspended for months at a time. Senior members of the medical profession, reacting to public fear of approaching panic, blamed the newspapers for promoting the fear leading to panic because of their reports of the <coughs> tragic and indeed fearful events. Interesting, however, how some of the large, we would call them now, multinational companies behaved. It is interesting to note that many large companies with the rise on the bottom line of the balance sheet, marketed their products in newspapers as having preventative qualities or curative qualities for the flu. These included the whiskey distillers in particular, spirit distillers, the soap makers, um, I had a couple of adverts here to demonstrate it, light boy, distant factory makers, JS Fluid, food supplement manufacturers such as Bottle and Oxo. I'm not sure whether Guinness is good for you came from that particular time or not. <coughs> Sorry. 
So there's the oxo one. Um, you know, drink oxo when you're not get the fluid, or you do, it will cure you very quickly. And uh, I think there's another one there, likewise. Yeah, likewise, you know, no problem. For health's sake, use likewise. So, you know, I never miss it, sir. So the consequences. The great flu, flu's effects on Irish society were very impervious. Over the year 1918-19, it affected the profits of very many businesses in Ireland, which could not operate normally for that period. You can all understand that. It infringed on election activity in the 1918 election. It delayed much in the GAA championship. It interrupted postal delivery. It cancelled essential markets, and basically it was a market economy in Ireland at that time. It caused school closures for long periods. It generally totally disrupted communities throughout the country with long-term effects due to high mortality rates in different communities. It also caused a sharp rise in the death rate for 1918-19. It certainly exposed the flawed nature of the public health system then in existence in Ireland and it substantially increased the annual running cost, cost for hospitals and other institutions for 1918 and they were carrying that debt with them for quite a while. In the short term, the flu's intrusion on Irish society was deep and far reaching, causing disruption in all facets of daily life. It affected politics, religion, economics, education, agriculture and law and law and order. For the most part, Partly due to the fact that it lasted less than a year, the flu's impact was temporary. Normal practices resumed after the waves had passed, leaving no long-term structure damage. There were, of course, exceptions. Hospitals were left with a burden of death that took years to dispose of. In excess of 20,000 families were irrevocably changed by this group. A proportion of men and women were left with permanent health damage and persi which persisted for years, and of course there was a residue of widows and widowers and orphans, many of them ended up in the industrial schools. However, in Ireland, the Great Flu made the biggest impact at family and community level, reshaping and transforming the lives of the survivors. The Great Flu hit hard, but thankfully it was relatively brief. The troubling memories which were left meant that there was little bit to talk about or remember those months of the season dead. There seemed to be a tacit agreement not to memorialise this terrible period then overshadowed by the huge political developments in Ireland and the end of the North World War. This facilitated the way historians avoided the subject until relatively modern times. A collective forgetting took place. Many who lived through the Great Flu did not or could not forget it. But there was no eagerness, eagerness to preserve its memory. Silence offered a refuge from difficult and tragic memories. Experts now know experts now know that the strain was H1N1, similar to avian and bird flu. It is probable that this flu jumped species to humankind. Advances in health, improved communications, vaccination programs, and of course antibiotics for treating secondary conditions all means that we are now better equipped for dealing with flu. However, one thing that the Great Flu demonstrated, it was and could be a cunning enemy, capable of rapid metamorphosis and always lurking in the background and constantly probing for human weakness. Viral infections even today can be devastating. And I give an example of the foot and mute mouth disease, which, which in living memory devastated the rural part of Ireland. And of course, very nearly we wouldn't have had, if, if, if the horse flu had a uh, thing, we wouldn't have gone national next Saturday. A few weeks ago, we had the equine scare. The great flu has taught, has at least taught us today, not to take flu lightly, as it is still capable of surprising mankind. The medical profession are well aware that it can be a dangerous enemy. The warning is currently, this warning is currently displayed in health centres and hospitals throughout the country and should not be taken away. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.